up to one fifth of your friends are lying to you or hiding something from you. How do I know this? I know that they're hiding it from you out of fear, out of stigma. How do I know this? Well, I know this because unlike your friends, I can't hide my disability like they can. And I know that your friends would think that you would treat them differently if you knew their secret. I know this because I've spent approximately half my life as somebody with a disability. And it still astounds me to this day how people treat me now compared to how they treat me, treated me before I had my disability. But I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Today is about telling tales, so I'll start with mine. And I want to tell you that the major focus of this tale is going to be perception of what I thought having a disability would be versus what it actually is. So I was 21 when I was injured by somebody who was drinking and driving. And just like all the stories you hear, laying in the hospital, the doctor comes in and says, uh, I got bad news for you, you know, your spine's severed, you're never gonna walk again. Spinal cord's completely cut, no chance. And just like every other story you hear, I said, not me, man, not gonna happen. Um, I lost a ton of weight, went to rehab, prayed, everything you're supposed to do. And if I could see that doctor today, I would look him straight in the eyes and I would say, you know what, dude, you are absolutely correct. And, and I say this because, you know, Doctors don't come into your room wanting to give you bad news, right? But we have this false narrative we're given. And we're given this narrative that if you're strong enough, if you're tough enough, if you believe enough, if you pray enough, whatever have you, if you do it enough, you'll return to, quote, normal. And I have to admit that um, I subscribed to that for probably a little bit longer than I should have. And like everyone else who saw the narrative online that if you do it enough, you're gonna get better. If you do it enough, you're gonna get better. And I'll tell you a little bit about today. I realized that that was just total, total garbage. Right, Matt, we're in the UK now. Total rubbish. <laughs> um, so at the time, um, I was still living in Florida. Has anyone here been to Florida? Okay, you love the wildlife, right? So I grew up in a place where I swam with gators, I swam with turtles, snakes, didn't matter. There's giant spiders, lizards, disgusting flying cockroaches that get into everything. None of that terrified me as much as the dreaded, terrorizing tree frog. <laughs> And let me explain something. So at the time, I did not have an accessible vehicle. So what I would do is I would transfer into the car, and someone else would take my chair apart, put it in the trunk. Same thing in reverse. So I'm sitting in the car one day, and just two inches of green and white terror lands on the dashboard. And I am sitting in the car, and I had some words go through my brain I'm not allowed to say. And it just stopped, and it turned and started to look at me with this red, red eyes, right? And I knew my life was in jeopardy. <laughs> and I had to get away. So my brain, what was left of it at that second, told my legs, go. And I went. And I think my brain forgot I was paralyzed because the signal didn't get through. And I remember hitting the sidewalk. Um, and I remember my father going, what the hell are you doing? And, and it was at that time I realized that this idea of mind over body is BS. If there was ever, ever gonna be a day I was gonna walk, it would have been that day. <laughs> But I didn't walk, I didn't run, I didn't stand. But I'll tell you what I did start to do after that. I started to adapt. You know, and I think one of the problems in our society is we 
don't give enough credit to people who adapt to life change. You know, if you didn't beat something, like you didn't beat cancer, you know, there's, there's a connotation there that you failed somehow. But I think adapting is harder, especially in a place where, at least for me, society is very inaccessible. A lot of people are very unaccepting. Um, so I think we need to change that narrative a little bit. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm a pretty accepting person. Let's do a little test. I want you to close your eyes for a second. All right. We got everybody? Okay. Now, you're sitting outside. It's a beautiful, sunny day. You're in front of a beautiful church, maybe Notre Dame. You guys have been traveling. And you see a gentleman coming towards you. And you know, you see him at first. Maybe you're feeding the pigeons. Some people like rats with wings. I'm not judging. <laughs> And as he gets closer, you notice he has on a green shirt and brown pants, but you also notice he's hunched over. He's using a cane, and he's limping. Now, some of you in your brain right now are seeing the hunchback of Notre Dame. Some of you are seeing an old man, and those of you really in touch with your feelings are saying, oh my God, look at this poor guy. All right, go ahead and open your eyes. So let's talk a little bit about this. This is not to shame anyone. The reason I'm bringing up the issue of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame, um, is that a lot of what we learn comes through media, television, uh, Facebook. And when you see people with a hunchback, what do you see? Do you see someone ringing church bells, someone helping an evil scientist? When's the last time you saw someone like that presented as a professor or a businessman? Doesn't happen very much, right? What about the old man stereotype? A lot of us socially are taught that disability comes with age, right? Even though statistically, it says that's not true. And lastly, the why do we feel sorry for this guy? So how many of you as kids were taught when you approach someone with a disability, don't talk to them, don't stare at them, don't ask questions, don't communicate. A lot of us are told that when we're young. And I see it today when I take my son to school. Don't ask, don't ask, don't talk. And really what that does is it sets up a place where when you get to adulthood, you don't talk. You know, like, okay, I'm not talking to them, you know? Um, but how do we start breaking down some of these barriers, okay? Well, one of the things I've seen over the past 20 years is that the LGBTQ community has just blown past the disability community, right? I mean, they did an amazing job blowing past us. They were on a float, and <laughs> flags everywhere. They were playing techno music. It was, a, it was beautiful, but they just blew past us. And one of the ways they did that is they started recruiting allies. And that's not something the disability community is known for. I would say most of you don't know if we're people with disabilities or disabled people. Um, I myself prefer Jason. Um, but I mean, and I know you guys sometimes get in those social situations where it's like, do I hold the door? Do I not hold the door? Do I ask if I hold the door? Or do I see him going towards the door? I'm gonna run past him and get inside so we ain't gotta address this at all. <laughs> But I think that change will start to come as trust is built. And I think a lot of that is going to come from folks like you. So as I said earlier, up to one in five people have a disability. A lot of them are hidden disabilities, and disabilities that people really just don't want to talk about. But today, for those of you who don't have your phones out, I want you to go ahead and take them out. And, oh, what a handsome gentleman. <laughs> and I want you to pull up your Facebook, your Instagram, your Atari, whatever you guys are using nowadays. <laughs> and you got, I heard some old people get that joke. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, you're going to start off with, I just saw the most amazing presentation I've ever seen in my life by Mr. Jason Olson. No? 
I've been, I was in DC for a while. I can't get past that self-promotion. Um, those without disabilities. Clicker work. There we go. Those without. Okay. So those without disabilities. I want you to send something out there just to the ether. And I want you to ask your friends to talk to you. It's not that hard. So to my friends with disabilities, I want you to know that I'm your ally. I want you to know more about the barriers that you are facing and how I can help you with addressing them. And then you're going to hashtag it, I'm with you. Little pro tip, capitalize each word. It helps screen readers and other things in case your friends have visual impairments. Those without disabilities, this is going to be much harder. Especially going to be hard for those people who pass as not having a disability. I want my friends to know that I'm a proud person with a disability, and I hope that you are an ally I can depend upon. If you'd like to know more about what it means to be a person with a disability or some of the barriers I face, please reach out to me. Now, we're up to 240 characters on Twitter, so I think you'd be all right. <laughs> and I think, you know, at least for those of us with obvious disabilities, one of the, one of the cruxes here is that by people with hidden disabilities coming out and letting people know that people who think they don't know people with disabilities actually do will help stop them from being locked up and locked out. It helps people realize, you know what, some of my friends do have disabilities. Now, I have brought an offer so that you do this. For those without disabilities, I'm going to forgive every single time you have used the disabled toilet. <laughs> it's retroactive only. This does not work in the future. And I'm sorry to say, if I happen to catch any of you in there, I have been known to park in front of the door and not let people out. <laughs> I don't recommend doing this. Not sure if it's kidnapping or not. So I would say mostly don't. Um, for those with disabilities, uh, I can give you the knowledge that you're going to help a lot of people and hopefully change society for the better. I'm going to give you one more example, just because I hope it's fun. Who here has heard the bitter cripple stereotype? Some of you are lying like crazy. Okay. So let me tell you how this changed for me. So before I had a disability, I think I assumed, like everyone else, that that bitter cripple came from self-hatred. It came from hating their disability, hating their body, whatever you want to call it. My realization over the past two decades of having a disability is it's much more <clears throat> in-depth than that. And I'll give you one small example, one small story. So, I'm up at 5 a.m., got to get to the train station before all the handicapped parking's taken. Go to get in the van, and the chain breaks to get into the van, right? So, if I'm someone without a disability, I just call a friend and say, hey, come pick me up. Having a disability, I don't have friends that have accessible cars or ramps in their vans. I can't call the taxi cabs because you have to book those at least a day can't call public transportation because you have to book those three days in advance. So somehow I jerry-rig it, I get in, I get to the train station, and let me remind you, it's three degrees outside, I'm not having the best morning. By the time I get there, there is no parking. I get the van open, I get it closed, but now I'm covered with grease. I go to the train station, I'm ready for the train, and it's so cold outside that the train attendant doesn't come out to see if anybody needs a ramp. So no one's coming out. I go to the train station, la la la, please make them get off the train, I need a ramp, okay. I'm now waiting 30 minutes for the next train. And I'm upstairs because in the walkway it might be five degrees instead of three degrees. So it's like a real heat wave for me. And I'm literally sitting in front of the elevator. And I see the train coming and I swear to you, I hit the button, and I'm sitting, the door open. I'm like, oh, okay, time to get to work. Eight people jump in front of me and go in the elevator. And you might say, well, maybe they didn't see you, and I'm calling BS on that. And here's why I'm calling BS. 
Have you ever seen, or what's the rule when you get on an elevator? You get on, right? You go in, you stop, you turn around, and everybody stares at the numbers. Like, okay, we're going to get there. For the first time in my life, I had seen this not happen. Everybody got on, stared at the back wall. <laughs> now, there is nothing back there. There's not a window. It's just a metal wall. <laughs> Now, let me ask you this. Did they, <laughs> did they see as I am, I mean, they broke me that day. Let's be honest. They broke me. I was pounding on the door, I remember, asking them if their mother pleasured people for money. <laughs> and as the door closed, I was just thinking, my God. Are they seeing someone who's trying to overcome a lot of barriers that they just contributed to, or are they seeing a bitter cripple? You know? And, and I would like to say that this was a unique situation, but, you know, it's broken elevators, it's them putting snow in the curb cuts, it's a lot of just microaggressions that happen on a daily basis that lead to... I'm not going to say always because some of us in wheelchairs and with disabilities are jerks just like everybody else. But sometimes it leads to this. And I hope that that gives you some understanding. And, and I just want you to know that I know how ingrained some of this stuff is for us. And, and I'll tell you how I know. Just one more brief story and I'll get off the stage. So when I first got injured, I was at the mall. And I saw a gentleman limping down the mall. And I'm sitting in my wheelchair, and I thought, oh my God, look at this poor guy. Right? He's walking. I should be like, way to go, dude. But you know, when I thought about it, that pity that came in me was not really about his lamp or his disability. It's because I knew, I knew what that lamp meant. And here's what it meant. It meant... People would treat him as less than a capable person. It meant that some people would see him as a burden to society. And quite honestly, it meant that some people would probably make fun of him. And, and I had to reconcile that with being a person with a disability who knew I could have a quality of life, who did have a quality of life, not despite the disability. Let me, let me say that again. Not despite the disability. Despite people yelling at me on the street despite uh, employers thinking disability means unemployable, despite fighting to go anywhere at any time to do anything. That was the despite, okay? So it's really some of these social and physical barriers that keep people out of society from the disability community. And I hope that some of the efforts you just made on your phone will lead in some small part to a social change that benefits us all. So thank you for your time today, and I hope you reach out to those friends, your stronger friendships develop, and maybe more of us will see you in society.